How should you treat an acute sickle cell pain episode? Are there any objective measures of a patient's level of pain? And what is your strategy for weaning pain medications in a patient in the hospital? These are all questions that I hope to address in today's video because there are a lot of misconceptions with how to treat sickle cell pain episodes. And there are plenty of mistakes that I have made personally that I've learned are not best practices. The first thing that I wanna briefly go over is terms to avoid because there are a lot of negative perceptions and connotations with some of the words that we use for sickle cell patients. And so one of the words that we should avoid is calling people sicklers, because this kind of has a pejorative connotation. The other thing that we should avoid is calling it a pain crisis. And I know this is a little controversial, and I'm even going to title this video sickle cell pain crisis, because this is generally how people call these episodes. They call it a vaso-occlusive pain crisis or a sickle cell pain crisis. But the emphasis on on the crisis part actually has a negative connotation as well. And then also avoiding terms like frequent flyer. This is, again has a very negative connotation and really we should just be quantifying how many times the patient has required hospitalization or ED visits. For example, a patient has had to come to the ED eight times in the past year is something that has a little bit less judgment associated with it. In regard to the initial evaluation, the number one thing is that analgesia should not be delayed. In fact, the 2020 American Society of Hematology recommendations recommended that analgesia should be provided within 60 minutes of when the patient presents. There are other recommendations that say that pain medications should even be given within 30 minutes of arrival to the ED. Generally, what happens is the patient gets an initial dose of Dilaudid, for example, or IV morphine. It kind of depends on the practice of your institution. And then they're reassessed in 20 to 30 minutes to see if they need an additional dose, they're given one. And if the patient's pain is relieved, then they can be discharged with some additional long-acting and PRN opioids. If the pain is not relieved after three or more doses, then it is indicated that the patient should be admitted to the hospital. And this is the first big learning point for sickle cell pain episodes, is that there is actually no objective way to quantify the patient's level of pain. And actually our gold standard of evaluating their pain is just going off the patient's report of pain. So I've done this multiple times in the past where I would look at their reticulocyte count, I would look at their anemia, levels of hemolysis, and I would kind of justify, hey, you know, it doesn't look like you're having that bad of a crisis right now. None of those things actually correlate to the patient's pain. So the gold standard, again, is the patient's report of pain. I think this is a very controversial point for a lot of people because all throughout our training nowadays, we are taught about how we need to really be very judicious with the amount of opioids that we prescribe to people and to have a very high index of suspicion for opioid misuse or addictive behavior, especially when people are requesting certain medications like IV medications. However, for sickle cell patients, this is actually the one scenario where we really have to be extremely, extremely aggressive with treating their pain and also taking them seriously when they report pain. Because of this particular patient population and the fact that most patients with sickle cell disease are black, there are a lot of times that there's this negative stigma against you know, providing pain medications to these patients, and it leads to all sorts of undertreatment of pain for these patients, and leads to a lot of trauma and distrust of the medical system and things like that. There's been multiple studies that show that the opioid dependence or opioid use disorder rate amongst sickle cell patients is actually lower than in the typical patient population. So if there's been any concerns that sickle cell patients are at higher risk for opioid use disorder because of their higher level of opioid use, that has actually been disproven in the literature. What I really hope this information changes for you is that it will make it a much lower threshold for you to treat their pain right away and very quickly and to treat it very aggressively with high doses of opioids. Because if we can get in front of their pain, we are going to lead to an overall much better hospitalization and hospital course in general. I'm sure that many of you have experienced those patients where it's really hard for you to tell if they are actually truly having pain anymore and it's been a super long time and you're, you're not sure, is this true sickle cell pain now or is this some kind of addictive or opioid use disorder behavior at this point. And so another good piece of information to have is the average duration of a sickle cell pain epi episode. So actually the average duration in adults is seven days. And by that, I mean the average hospital stay is seven days. 
And then in children, it's 4.5 days. So this hopefully will give you some context that you know, day four or five, if patient is still having significant pain, this is not actually unexpected for their co their course, and it may take a little bit longer for their pain to start resolving. And then what they do recommend is that if the pain is lasting more than 10 days, you should start looking for alternative causes of pain. For example, they could have gout or uh, they tore a rotator cuff or something, or they could have depressive symptoms that are contributing to their ongoing pain. So after 10 days, check for alternative sources. All right, and then next, I want to emphasize the importance of clarifying with the patient, is this their typical pain or is the pain that they're experiencing right now classic for their sickle cell pain episodes? And typically the most common areas that you are going to have pain are going to be in the chest, the back, abdomen, and long bones. And this is a very important question to ask because if the patient is having pain that is atypical from their classic sickle cell pain episodes, then it really has to make you think of, is there a secondary complication going on? For example, if the pain is in multiple sites, then you have to worry about multi-organ failure or rapidly progressive acute chest syndrome. Acute or delayed transfusion reactions can also cause this. If there is a headache, then we worry about a stroke or an intracranial bleed, for example, from an aneurysm or meningitis. Significant chest pain that's different from their typical pain definitely raises the concern for acute chest syndrome, but also PE and cardiac ischemia. Abdominal pain that's worse from their typical episode could be from a whole host of different complications, but the main ones that we think of is going to be a splenic or hepatic complication, but also, of course, your typical pancreatitis, UTI, cholecystitis, etc. And if their extremities are having extreme pain, then we have to look into possible avascular necrosis, which is a very common complication, DVT, and osteomyelitis. So again, determine if the pain is typical for the patient, and if it's not, you really should do some more digging to see if there is a secondary complication going on. Once you've determined that the pain is a typical pain episode, what is really recommended once they're getting admitted to the hospital is starting them oftentimes on a PCA or patient-controlled analgesia, mainly because this helps limit the time that the patient has to be asking for a PRN and then the nurse has to go get it, verified by pharmacy, and there's all these delays. With a PCA, the patient can just control it on their own without any, any issues. Furthermore, it's thought to be a little bit safer because if a patient is starting to get respiratory depression or they're sleeping and becoming obtunded, then they're not going to be pressing the PCA for additional doses. And so it's much harder for a patient to overdose on a PCA compared to scheduled or PRN doses, which may be too large for them. So number one, I would say is really you should highly consider starting continuous opioids or PCA. And one thing that I learned here and is something that may vary from your institution or not is whether to just do PRN or demand doses on the PCA, or if you should also put them on a continuous basal dose as well. And so actually the American Pain Society actually recommends that you do give a basal rate. The American Society of Hematology does not offer a recommendation regarding this. Per their 2020 guidelines, no recommendation for or against basal dosing. What I will say, however, is that multiple experts are kind of favoring this basal rate strategy because patients with sickle cell pain episodes, if they only have the PRN or demand dosing, they're gonna to have to be awake to press that. And so in the middle of the night, they are going to have uncontrolled pain. They're gonna be constantly waking up and getting very poor sleep quality. Basically, just it's gonna worsen their entire experience and the quality of their sleep while they're in the hospital. So by maintaining a basal rate, you are going to improve the chance that they're able to get restful sleep, which we know is important for their recovery, and minimize the number of times that they're gonna wake up in the middle of the night with severe pain, requiring them to press their PCA. In order to choose the dose of the dilaudid, Typically, you're going to look at what they have required in the past and then kind of go off of that. So initial dosing based on prior needs. So that's strategy number one. But another strategy is you can continue their home long-acting opioid and then add the PRN demand PCA on top of that. One of the recommendations also is that your PRN should be about one-sixth the basal dose. From here, you're going to need to reassess the patient. So if the patient's pain is uncontrolled, how are you gonna go about increasing the pain or opioid regimen for your patient? Is there a systematic way that you can approach 
increasing their opioid doses. And so generally what they say here is that if they have used their demand dose more than three times for the last two hours, then you should go up on their opioid dosing. Oh, and I forgot to mention this, but the American Pain Society also recommends demand dosing to be given a lockout period of Q20 minutes. So a lot of times I was struggling ordering dilated PCAs, not knowing do they need Q10 minute, Q15 minute lockout, Q30 minute lockout. So the recommendation from the American Pain Society is every 20 minutes. So that should help make it standardized for you. And that also goes to show why if they're demanding more than three times in the last two hours, that's because they're demanding more than what's currently allocated for them. And so that's a sign that you should increase their dosing. And so the way that you want to increase their dosing is tally up the total amount of opioids that they have used in the last hour and set that as your new basal rate and then add a PRN demand doses on top of that. All right. So calculate the total opioid dosing over the last hour and set that as your new basal rate plus add a PRN demand dosing on top of that. Now, what if you have gotten the patient's pain under control? Well, then we're going to have to start tapering. And there's not really a lot of great guidelines for how to start tapering these patients, but there are some general tips that are given by experts. So at this point, we will start tapering. Number one is do not taper in first 24 hours unless there's significant respiratory depression or lethargy. Taper opioids during the daytime rather than at nighttime, because then you can do a frequent reassessment on how the patient's taper is going. Taper incrementally, so about 10 to 20% of the dosing at a time. Decrease the dose of opioids, rather than increasing the lockout interval in between demand doses. This is a really important one, because a lot of times I had patients where I would start spacing out the demand dosing from Q1 hour to Q2 hours to Q3 hours, and that is actually not recommended. You should just go d down on the dose instead. And then in order to get them back on their home medications or knowing when to convert them to their home medications, you should do this once the patient is nearing their home dose of pain medications. So once the IV dose is relatively equivalent to their home medication dosing. And the way that you're going to do this is you're going to go to opioid calculators and you're going to calculate the morphine milli equivalents to compare their current IV dosing versus their home regimen. And then once it's pretty close, then you can switch them back to oral medications. And finally, I do want to put a recommendation from the AAFP that I also found, and they recommended weaning when the patient tells you that their pain is less than five on a visual analog scale. And again, this is where it becomes a little difficult because I know a lot of times the patient every single day that you go see them is saying, hey, my pain is 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. Every single day is 10 out of 10. Well, in the first few days, that may be considered normal, but now you know that the typical duration of a hospital stay is about seven days. And after 10 days, that's when you have to start thinking about secondary causes of pain and could things like depression or other comorbidities be contributing. And so it will at least give you a good sense of what you should expect from the time course. And if they're still having 10 out of 10 pain every single day, then you're going to try and start addressing different aspects of pain management with the patient. All right, now let's move on to some other therapies. So another one that's really gaining big time popularity is ketamine, and it's found very good success in this sickle cell patient population. Remember, it's an NMDA receptor antagonist, and the way it works for pain is that it has some weak activity at the mu and kappa receptors. And remember, it has kind of two dosing ranges. You've got like an analgesia dosing range, which is a little bit lower, and then you have an anesthetic dosing range, which is for like sedation for procedures or intubation, things like that. It also has somewhat of an antidepressive effect, which can be very useful for your sickle cell patients as well. There's a couple ways that people do this. So they can give like an intranasal dose and the, the dose is recommended at 0.25 micrograms per kilogram. You could do a continuous IV, so a drip at three to five micrograms per kilogram per minute. And perhaps the easiest way would be PO ketamine, and you can start at a dose of 10 to 15 milligrams every six hours. And then you can continue increasing by 10 milligrams every six hours daily until the pain is relieved. Don't forget your side effects, which can be an increase in your heart rate, increase in your blood pressure, and also it can cause increase in your LFTs. So you should make sure to monitor them. And also you can get those hallucinations and emergence reactions, although typically I believe those are more at the anesthesia dosing ranges of ketamine. The next treatment that you're going to see is going to be NSAIDs with particular attention to Ketorolac. 
And the evidence and recommendations on this are a little bit mixed. So if you look at the American Society of Hematology, they do recommend a short course of five to seven days of NSAIDs. Per the expert panel on UpToDate, however, they do not recommend routine use, basically because there have been no RCTs showing efficacy in individuals receiving opioids. And there's a significant increase in risk for acute or chronic kidney injury. And they listed that the risk is actually greater than 63% higher. Treatment number four is gonna be fluids. And the evidence for fluids is also not super great, but hypovolemia and dehydration is pretty common in these patients because if they're in a lot of pain, they may not be adequately hydrating themselves. And so it is very reasonable and generally low risk to be giving them fluids. But sickle cell pain crisis by itself does not warrant continuous fluids if the patient appears euvolemic. So basically just give them fluids as indicated by their volume status. I've talked about methadone on my recent video for opioid use disorder, but remember that it's a long-acting opioid and it can be used in sickle cell pain episodes as well, mainly because of the benefit of a uh, neuropathic pain benefit. Regarding management for pruritus, this is very common in these patients. So uh, you'll see a lot of these patients are gonna be on Benadryl, they're gonna be on hydroxyzine. And so the reason is because IV opioids tend to activate the mast cells and release histamine. This is more significant with IV morphine compared to IV dilated, but it is present in both. So IV morphine greater than IV dilated. And the recommendation here is to rely on PO antihistamines, such as hydroxyzine and Benadryl. A lot of times patients are going to request IV Benadryl. And the reason we want to avoid this is that IV Benadryl can cause a high or euphoric effect by itself. So this is something we want to avoid. We want to get that benefit of the antihistamine effect without causing an additional high or euphoria. And if really needed, you'll see this sometimes is that some people will be put on continuous low dose naloxone. And this was always really confusing to me because I was like, why is this patient on a PCA on naloxone? Isn't that going to be canceling out all of the opioid effect that they're getting? But actually, this is one of the treatments for pruritus induced by opioids. And so basically, you do a really low rate, so 0.25 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And that helps prevent some of the symptoms of pruritus. Let's talk about adjunctive therapies. So we prefer heat packs. Avoid cold packs because that can actually induce sickling. Remember, cold kind of induces sickling. Psychosocial support and emotional counseling, insomnia treatment, and antidepressants. Most specifically, the American Society of Hematology really favors SNRIs such as duloxetine, especially for patients who have avascular necrosis and also TCAs. So this is generally for avascular necrosis, or for just chronic pain in general, mainly based on evidence from patients with fibromyalgia, as this was selected as the most similar entity to chronic pain from sickle cell disease. Next, let's talk about transfusions. And the key thing to know here is you have what's called a simple transfusion versus an exchange transfusion. And the simple transfusion is basically what it sounds like. It's the same as any normal transfusion. You just give a, a unit of packed red blood cells. Whereas the exchange transfusion is something we tend to reserve for more severe disease with complications. And basically it involves removing the patient's own blood and replacing it with non-sickled blood in order to reduce the hemoglobin S level and the amount of sickled cells that are in the patient's blood. One of the biggest mistakes is over-transfusing patients with sickle cell disease because we actually don't use that typical threshold of less than seven grams per deciliter of hemoglobin to transfuse. Instead, the threshold for transfusing patients tends to be set at less than five in adults or if it's less than two from their baseline, or if they have symptomatic anemia. So if patient is at a hemoglobin of 6.5, but they kind of tend to run around six or seven range, and they don't have significant new anemia symptoms like dyspnea or fatigue, then a simple transfusion would not be indicated. And then once you're getting into complications, sometimes the reasons for exchange transfusion include complications like stroke, acute chest syndrome, which could also be treated with 
uh, simple transfusion, and multi-organ failure. So why are we so judicious with giving transfusions to patients with sickle cell disease? The reason is because there's multiple risks of transfusions. So first of all, these patients receive a very large amount of transfusions throughout their life, which can lead to significant iron overload. I've seen patients with ferritins in the 9,000s, 10,000s range, and that causes a lot of inflammation and damage to the body, particularly in the liver. So iron overload is a definite risk. These patients also tend to develop antibodies. The more transfusions that you give, the more likely they're going to start developing antibodies to more and more blood products, and they'll start having hemolytic reactions, either acute or delayed hemolytic reactions to transfusions. You can also develop something called a hyperhemolytic syndrome. And also you can increase the blood viscosity too much, which can lead to a stroke and other various complications from a hypercoagulable state. So again, these are the risks of over-transfusing patients and is why we tend not to transfuse unless absolutely needed. Other questions you may get about this is that if a patient is planned for a surgery, then we have a pre-op transfusion goal of greater than 10. You may be asked if prophylactic transfusions during pregnancy are indicated, and the answer is no. However, there is strong evidence for prophylactic transfusions for people who have had certain complications such as stroke, acute chest syndrome, priapism, and pulmonary hypertension. In fact, it's been shown that these prophylactic transfusions actually reduce stroke risk by 50%. Finally, you may be asked what the goal hemoglobin S percentage is after an exchange transfusion, and the answer to that would be less than 30% after an exchange transfusion. So one of the things we do is we get the hemoglobin electrophoresis and interpret the amount of hemoglobin S before and after the exchange transfusion. And then finally, remember that our treatment for iron overload would be an iron chelating agent, such as deferoxamine is what we typically learn, but apparently it's not actually that favored. Instead, there is a more convenient and easier to take medication called defacirox, which is actually the favored medication. Next, let's talk about some outpatient management or maintenance medications. And the mainstay of therapy that every patient with sickle cell disease should pretty much be on, unless they can't tolerate, is going to be hydroxyurea. And this is really, really important that they're on this medication because it's the only medication that has been shown to decrease mortality. The way it works is that it increases your hemoglobin F levels which basically reduces the percentage of sickled cells that you have out there. And hemoglobin F has a high affinity for oxygen, which actually improves oxygen delivery. And then also you increase the water content of red blood cells. All of this leads to decreased need for transfusions and decreased pain episodes. One of the things that we often like to track in patients on hydroxyurea is their MCV. Typically, you're going to see a macrocytosis, and so you want to see that in the hundreds. And it's actually used as a marker for if the patient has been taking their hydroxyurea or not. So if a patient has a low MCV and they're supposedly on hydroxyurea, that can actually show you that potentially they're not having good adherence to the medication, and you can, you can counsel them that they need to stay more adherent to it. The other options that are available is L-glutamine, which basically increases antioxidant activity in red blood cells and reduces pain episodes. There's a monoclonal antibody called Crizanlizumab, which is an antibody against P-selectin and prevents interaction between endothelial cells. This one has also been shown to decrease pain episodes. And then finally, there's this more recently FDA-approved medication, just approved in 2019, which is called Voxelator, and it directly binds hemoglobin and increases its oxygen affinity. Now, in some large studies, it did not actually show a very a significant effect, but then as they did some post-market data collection, they did see that 51% of patients had an increase in hemoglobin by more than one point, and there was a 34% reduction in vasoocclusive episodes in patients in a post-market database. Finally, all these patients should be on folic acid and probably a, a multivitamin as well because their bone marrow is constantly producing red blood cells to make up for the hemolyzing sickled cells. And so it's very easy for them to become folate deplete. And also we have a low threshold to screen for pulmonary hypertension, which is a very common complication in sickle cell patients. There is also a recommendation that if patients are having 
a vaso occlusive episode or a sickle cell pain episode that they can actually go to these sickle cell day infusion centers where they are a little bit more familiar and, and deal with sickle cell patients more frequently. So they're a little bit more equipped to get them that pain control rapidly and right away and can prevent them from potentially needing to be admitted or having a worsening of their pain episode. So uh, day infusion centers are preferred over the ED for pain episodes. And then finally, one last thing that I wanted to mention here is that they are starting to do more allogeneic bone marrow transplants as a one-time curative treatment for sickle cell disease. And it has better response rates at younger ages. So as the success rates for bone marrow transplants continues improving, we may start to see that more over time as well. A couple last bonus questions. So one thing that we see sometimes is some questions about hemoglobin SC disease. And this is sometimes thought to be a more milder version of hemoglobin SS disease, although it's a little bit controversial about whether it truly is more mild or not. But what we do see in these patients is that they do tend to have a higher baseline hemoglobin. I'll say that it's possibly more mild but these patients can certain, certainly still have very significant pain episodes requiring very aggressive treatment. So you should not downplay somebody who has hemoglobin SC disease who's presenting with pain. And these patients have an increased risk for retinopathy and other eye complications compared to hemoglobin SS disease. So it's very important to get ophthalmology involved very early on to do routine screening for these patients. So that's it for hemoglobin SC disease. Now we're gonna move back and I did want to touch base really quickly on acute chest syndrome. So as we mentioned, one of the complications is acute chest syndrome. And so acute chest syndrome, you should suspect if there's ever a new radio density on chest imaging, plus a fever or respiratory symptoms. And what's recommended for this is pain control, oxygen saturation greater than 95%, antibiotics. So treat this basically like a pneumonia and then a simple versus exchange transfusion, depending on how sick they are. All right, and I know this was a very extensive and comprehensive video. I'm sure there was a ton of stuff that I could not cover, but I thought this was a good overview of everything that you really should know for the management of sickle cell disease and a lot of the common mistakes and misconceptions that we have about it and how we can actually provide better care for these patients because it truly is a very difficult patient population to deal with because the lack of objective data that we have and some of the negative perceptions that have kind of led to these patients being stigmatized. So it makes it a very difficult situation. A lot of these patients have been traumatized by the medical system too. They'll be very guarded and they're obviously in a lot of pain. So sometimes it can make it hard to build rapport with these patients. But I'm hoping that this approach where we really try to maximize our control of their pain, we don't downplay things, we don't try to aggressively wean them when it's too early. Hopefully these will lead to better experiences for these patients and better outcomes for them as well. Most of my sources for this video were from the American Society of Hematology, the American Pain Society, as well as UpToDate, Consensus Expert Panel, as well as some American Family Physician publications and New England Journal of Med Medicine publications. I did wanna go over quickly the 2020 ASH guidelines, which kind of covers a lot of the stuff we did here. But in case you wanted to see their official recommendations, I kind of summarized it here in easier to read format. If they said recommends, this is a strong recommendation. And if they suggest, it's kind of a weaker recommendation. So they recommend rapid assessment and administration of analgesia with frequent assessments every 30 to 60 minutes. They suggest tailoring opioid dosing based on baseline opioid therapy and prior effective therapy. They suggest a short course of NSAIDs, five to seven days. They suggest against corticosteroids for pain management. They suggest regional anesthesia treatment for localized pain that is refractory or not controlled by opioids. No recommendation regarding fluids. They suggest massage, yoga, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, virtual reality, and guided audiovisual relaxation in addition to standard pharmacologic management. They suggest using sickle cell disease specific hospital-based acute care facilities such as day hospitals and infusion centers over typical ED-based care. No recommendation for or against basal opioid dosing in conjunction with on-demand dosing or scheduled intermittent dosing. They suggest the use of duloxetine or other SNRIs for chronic pain, especially with avascular necrosis suggest use of NSAIDs for avascular necrosis, no recommendation for these things in children with the same conditions, and no recommendation for treatment of leg ulcers. They do recommend SNRIs for SED-related chronic pain, and they suggest tricyclic antidepressants as well for chronic pain. 
They suggest cognitive and behavioral pain management strategies such as CBT. They suggest integrated approaches such as massage therapy and acupuncture. And then they have several other recommendations regarding the initiation of chronic opioid therapy and monthly transfusions. Please let me know in the comments down below how you manage sickle cell disease and acute pain episodes. What are your strategies for tapering their medications down? Do you use a continuous or basal rate on your PCA or do you just use demand dosing? And please let me know if you have any questions about any of the things I said or any comments, suggestions, or feedback. I'm really curious to hear what your guys' thoughts are. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.